All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump into our study here this evening. Um, the book of Exodus, it's a book that we all, I would think, at least know about. And certainly as we make our way through it, there are many stories that come from the book of Exodus. Many of these stories uh, make up the Bible stories or the children's stories or even movies that have been made, even Disney movies uh, about some of the events that are recorded here in this book. Uh, Exodus is known by the Jewish teachers, the rabbis, as the book of names. The book of names, it's called that because the book begins with the list of those names who came out of Egypt, uh, the sons of Jacob, who uh, Jacob, of course, being Israel, the father of Israel, and, uh, um, and, and it's a book that tells of God fulfilling his promise to Abraham by multiplying Abraham's descendants into a great nation. And so really the book of Exodus gives us the, uh, the account, if you will, of the birth of Israel as God's people. It tells us of how God delivered them from slavery in Egypt and how he led them to the promised land and, and uh, there in their time in their wilderness at Mount Sinai, how God made a covenant with them, how he made Israel his people and himself their God. Now, the title Exodus is a word meaning exit or out of, and it speaks of Israel's departure from Egypt, and this is going to be a theme throughout the book, this idea of deliverance and the idea of freedom, because this is the book of Israel being freed from their bondage in Egypt. But what is unique, uh, I would say, and we'll touch on this again probably many times throughout our study, which by the way, this is going to take us into 2023. We're not going to wrap up this study by the end of the year, and uh, so we'll be into next year before we wrap up this book. But what's unique about the freedom that we see for the people Israel, and this is true for us as well, is that what we need to understand is that we have not been freed from bondage in Egypt, uh, or I should say God's people were not freed from bondage in Egypt. And for us, there's sort of a, a metaphor there. Egypt, we'll see, often serves as a picture of the world. And so we've been uh, freed as well from our bondage to the things of this world as believers in Christ. But we're not freed from that uh, in order to just pursue our own desires and do whatever it is that we want to do. That's what a lot of times people misunderstand about uh, freedom in Christ. But rather, we have been freed from the things of this world in order to follow Jesus. And similarly, Israel was freed from bondage in Egypt to be obedient to God. They were brought into a covenant relationship with God. And I mention that because this is then much of the tension, if you will, or for lack of a better term, that we're going to find throughout the book of Exodus. And we feel it, I would think, in our own lives as well, is is that, okay, here is this thing that we have been freed from, we've been released from, and now we're to be brought into this covenant relationship with God, but yet there's still a tension, there's a pull between those two things. And we're going to see this, of course, with the nation of Israel as on a regular basis, we find them sort of looking back, looking back to Egypt, looking back to that time in bondage, and, and, and somewhat surprisingly to us as we read through the book, we go, man, they, they want to go back to that? They want to go back into bondage in Egypt? They think that, that the experience that they had in Egypt is going to be better than the relationship with God? And of course, as we encounter those things and we experience those feelings, hopefully the Holy Spirit helps us to see that, yeah, we do that same thing, don't we? We, we can often find ourselves looking back to life before Christ or the things of the world, and it still has a little bit of a, a draw on us. And so much of the book of Exodus then is really about God's people truly coming out of Egypt. It's often been said God miraculously removed them from Egypt, but it took a little bit of time for Egypt to get out of them. And um, I think that that's a, uh, a way in which we can sometimes characterize the Christian life. And so we'll see in this book uh, or rather, we'll learn uh, much of the man of the man Moses um, and how it was under the direct command of God and as a leader of Israel that Moses, he receives the Ten Commandments. So we'll consider that. He receives God's law. Um, 
We'll read of God forming a covenant relationship, as, I, as I've mentioned, with his people. Uh, we'll read of the tabernacle, and that's one of the things I'm, I'm most excited about for our study through Exodus um, this time around, uh, because we're going to consider the tabernacle somewhat in depth, and what is the significance of the tabernacle and the elements there within the tabernacle, and, and really how that speaks to God desiring to be present among his people. Uh, and how that foreshadows his presence among and within us today. And of course, we're going to read of the journey out of Egypt and all that this entailed, including one of the more pivotal moments in all of Old Testament history, that of the Passover. And so we'll consider the Passover as well. And beyond this, we're going to learn of how Exodus is a continuation of the book of Genesis as well. You know, in our Bible, we are often to say that we're, uh, I don't know the right term to use necessarily, but sometimes when we, when we look at our Bible and we, we look at each of the books very distinctly and then we have chapter and verse, uh, it can cause us sometimes to sort of overlook or not consider perhaps the way in which some of these books were originally uh, laid out. And so uh, we must think of Exodus as a continuation of the book of Genesis. You know, originally the, the first five books, the Pente we know this as the Pentateuch or Torah, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, that these five books, they were the books of Moses. They are the books of Moses. And, and really, it's believed that originally they were one account. And so here in chapter 1 of Exodus, we'll see here uh, shortly, you can look at it there in chapter 1, you'll see that chapter 1 probably begins in, uh, if you have New King James, you'll see that it begins with the word now. If you have a different translation, it might say and. Quite frankly, I think and is probably a better translation of that first word. And so it's interesting to say, well, here's this book that's beginning with and. Well, normally, we're taught we don't begin sentences that way. We don't begin a paper or a story that way. Uh, but it would make sense if Moses is continuing on from that last verse in Genesis. Genesis chapter 50, the last chapter in Genesis, verse 26, the last verse in all of Genesis says, so Joseph died being 110 years old and they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt and if you then jump to verse 1 of Exodus 1, these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. And so again, a continuation of that account. And I'll touch more on that in a moment. And remember, here tonight we're doing a little bit of just introduction uh, to the book. You're probably accustomed to reading this, to hearing this, to maybe hearing me say this as we start a new book. And that is that regarding authorship, I've already been talking about Moses. As you might imagine, there's critics everywhere who say uh, of any book in the Bible, well, I don't think that's really who wrote this, and people who want to sort of pick those things apart. And so, of course, there are critics that have challenged this book as well, whether Moses is, in fact, the author of Exodus. Some say that it is a series of oral and written documents that were combined over time and were sort of brought together later on in Israel's history. But I would say that there's really no reason to think that. Um, there isn't. There's, there's really no reason to think this. And, and we could go into depth, but I don't think there's a whole ton of value in doing that here this evening. Um, but there's a lot of internal, meaning within the book of Exodus, as well as external and other books within the Bible, as well as extra biblical sources, that would certainly make a strong case and have made a strong case that Moses is the author. Uh, but what I'll share with you this evening so that we just don't get off track and go into all of those things is that there's really only one verse that I need in Scripture um, to uh, convince me that Moses is the author of this particular book. And that comes from the Gospel of John in chapter 5, verse 46, when Jesus himself says, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. And he references uh, verses from Exodus. And so for me, and we know Jesus makes several references to Mosaic authorship throughout the Gospels. And so for me, call it simplistic, but if Jesus says that Moses was the author, that's sufficient enough for me. Are we good? Praise God. Okay. Um, 
If anybody wants to argue with Jesus, you can take that up in your prayer time. Um, so what of the time of the writing of the book of Exodus? The earliest date, so again, let's put this into context. We need to just kind of understand. The earliest dates for the writing of Exodus, uh, most people put at 1445 B.C., and so this book would have likely been written during the time of the 40-year wilderness journey, which led right up to approximately 1405 B.C. And it's thought that Moses probably kept an account of God's work throughout uh, the time of his ministry and, and maybe finished compiling all of this prior to his death uh, there um, not far, of course, from the, uh, the promised land that he never would enter. And so Exodus covers the time span, really, and though it doesn't cover much of this, but it, it sort of captures this time frame of Jacob's arrival in Egypt uh, around 1875 B.C., all the way up to then what we see at the end of Exodus, the building of the tabernacle, about 430 years later and so a lot of time has passed okay a lot of time has passed and um, a key verse for us and really our understanding of exodus this is one that we'll come back to often is found if you're taking notes you can write this one down exodus chapter 6 verses 6 through 8 uh, this is a critical verse in the account of the book of exodus which says therefore say to the children of israel I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. And so this passage really gives us a good summary of the book. It gives us a summary of what's happening, what God is doing. And I think, and this is really important, I want to state this here at the beginning of our study. And, and maybe... Maybe this, is, maybe this is nuance. Maybe this is just slightly a different way of, of saying uh, some of the same things. But it's important to recognize that this is God's covenant with Israel. And, and that he is, he is making this covenant with Israel. And it goes back. So here in, in, in Exodus chapter 6, what, what I just read there in verses uh, six through eight, it, it really goes back all the way to the promises of Genesis. It goes back to Genesis 3.15, which that's the promise that God makes there after the fall of, of Adam and Eve and God's promise um, to redeem them. It goes back to Abraham in Genesis uh, chapter 12 and verses one through three. That's when God made his covenant at first with Abraham and, and promised to make of him a great nation. And, and I mention these things because it's important for us to consider because, because sometimes I think we can look at the Old Testament and if we're not careful, we can see the Old Testament somewhat as a, a separate or, or, or different set of books than the, the New Testament. And some people will even say, I've heard this said before, that the Old Testament is sort of God's uh, plan of salvation part A, and it failed. And then in the New Testament, we have God's plan of salvation, which was sort of plan B, and that succeeded. And people that adopt that sort of thinking are inclined to sort of separate the Old Testament from the New Testament. And you'll often find that, that such individuals will refer to the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. And that the God of the Old Testament is a very difficult God, and he's an angry God, and he's a, uh, you know, all these different things. But then we got the God of the New Testament, and well, of course, we need to understand, and hopefully all of us are like, well, yeah, we, we got this, right? That it's the same God. Same God. God of the Old Testament, God of the New Testament, same God. And 
It's not that there was a plan A and then a plan B. It's not that along the way God changed his mind. But rather, what we need to understand and why I'm pointing this out here this evening is because uh, when we think of Old Testament, New Testament, we, we need to think of it in terms of here's our whole Bible. And it goes from Genesis to Revelation. And what, we, and, and what we call that is oftentimes the grand narrative of Scripture. And to understand that what, what God has given us in his word and what we see throughout history and what will uh, yet come is a plan of salvation that spans from creation to new creation. Those are the bookends of Scripture. It begins with creation, and then it goes and it ends with new creation. And in between, we see all of God's plan of salvation unfold. And that, is, that comes into play all the way there. We studied this when we went through Genesis. That comes into play there at the very beginning of Genesis. God begins his plan of salvation as man uh, sins and death enters in. And so Exodus here, as we look at these things, is a continuation of God's plan of salvation, but it's not just one that's specific to the Old Testament or not just something that we need to look at and go, oh, look what God did for the nation of Israel, albeit he did, but rather to look back on these things than to say that we are a part of this. This is also part of our story of salvation and how God has been working throughout history. Is that making sense? And so these aren't simply about stories, the things that happened to another people, but rather things that are a part of our history and our story. And so it's all part of the story of salvation. And as we pick up here in Exodus, we'll see then that Israel has indeed multiplied. What God said that he would do for the nation of Israel, he did and is doing. And this, the fact that they are multiplying here as we pick up in Exodus uh, has then become a bit of a problem for the Pharaoh, the new Pharaoh who is over Egypt because uh, he's concerned that Israel is becoming great, too great, in fact. And so, um, so as, we, as we jump into this and as we consider these things and as we think about Israel becoming a great nation and, and as we read all that we will and study throughout this book, we must understand that it's part of the greater story and it's even part of our story, that our story of salvation it connects back to the book of Exodus, it connects back to the book of Genesis. And, uh, and that's part of what makes the study of the Old Testament so fun is... Um, is we get the opportunity to see what God has been doing all throughout history, even up to today, and that all of these things truly connect. And so let's go ahead and, and, and jump into this in chapter 1. <clears throat> we read here, let's go ahead and read uh, just verses 1 through 7. Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man and his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, for Joseph was in Egypt already, and Joseph died, all his brothers in all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. So here we have the account of those who, are, uh, who, who came with Jacob, who came to Egypt, and, and then those who are then going to be coming out of Egypt. And what's clear to us here, or should be, is that, man, these people are now a mighty people. We're given a number here at the beginning of the book. It says that there were 70 aside from Joseph and his family. Um, and now they've multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty. Exceedingly mighty. That's a good description. And so we know Israel has multiplied. And according to, there's two different places in Exodus. There's Exodus chapter 12, verse 37, and there's Exodus chapter 38, verse 26, that give us a little bit more insight into how exceedingly mighty are they? And well, if we look at those two verses, what we find is that there are more than, comprised amongst Israel at this time, there are more than 600,000 men of Israel age 20 and up. 
And so remember, when typically in Scripture, when you're numbering a people, they're going to number the adult males. That's typically what we're going to find when we see those numbers. And so we find that there's 600,000 adult males. And so then we can't have an exact number, but there's you know pretty good information to help us with if we then consider the women and children that would be associated with 600,000 adult men, we would then find that Israel is numbered anywhere from 2 to 3 million people at this particular point. So I think it's safe to say that they have grown and are exceedingly mighty after this period of time. If they were just you know 70 or so originally, then God has certainly made good on his promise two to three million people so they've prospered and this is what god said would happen so so if we look at this you know i keep referencing what what god said he would do and he says it in a few different uh, places but in genesis in genesis chapter 15 i think i think it's in verse 5 this is where god makes a covenant again with with abraham and and uh he brings him outside. This is the point where God leads Abraham outside, and he, he tells him to look now toward the heaven in verse 5. And he says, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And so now we, you know, fast forward hundreds of years, and we're talking about two to three million people. From a man who, who had no offspring. God is faithful. God has and had a plan for Abraham. And, and this is part of what we need to see here through the first part of, or for, through chapter 1 and, and Exodus really into, into chapter 2 as well is that, um, you know, we're getting an account here of what's happened to Israel. But what we're also seeing is, is God's faithfulness. We're seeing God work. We're seeing God do what God said he was going to do, albeit on a probably different timeline than many of them uh, have ever imagined and, um, and so this is a pretty incredible thing to see how God has been at work. But again, this became a problem. The fact that they became exceedingly mighty was a problem. We see this in verses 8 through 10 of Exodus 1. It says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and it happened in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. So the king of Egypt, the pharaoh at this particular time, is a little concerned by the increasing population of the nation of Israel. Knowing that, and we can even say, let's say we're on the conservative side and we're going to call it two million people. But just to put that into perspective, within the city limits of Atlanta is currently about 500,000 people. I actually thought it was more than that when I looked it up earlier today, but uh, 500,000 people. Now, when we think of big cities near us, we would think of Atlanta as being a city full of a lot of people. It doesn't really even begin to hold a candle to just the population of Israel that was there on the outskirts of Egypt at this time. Now, it's believed, and again, these are numbers that we certainly we can't say for sure, but... Um, people do their studies and they look into these things, is believed that the population of Egypt at the time of the Exodus is estimated at about three or four million. And so I mentioned those things just to give us a sense of the fact that, that two million people, three million people, that's going to feel like a lot. That's going to feel like quite a presence. And so there was reason for Pharaoh, who by the way, we don't know who the Pharaoh was at this particular time. A lot of people say Ramses. We, we don't really know. It's a it's a, it's a serious uh, rabbit trail that you start to go down if you want to try and figure out who the Pharaoh was at that particular time. Um, but, but there was sufficient reason for him to be concerned. Um, and if not for the Israelites themselves, if he wasn't necessarily concerned in terms of, you know, hey, I've got three to four million people, we're still uh, mightier than they, Clearly what's communicated here is that what if they align themselves with some of the opposing forces around Egypt, then it could be a major problem for us. And so uh, a period, so what's happening now then, uh, because of the, the, the threat that they potentially pose, uh, 
And many say that this particular dynasty, this pharaoh, uh, as, as he came into power, was very much uh, what you could say is sort of a nationalist dynasty. And so there was very much an effort to expel any foreigners from the land. Um, and so this kind of characterized this particular time. And so for Israel, this time of peace and prosperity was very much uh, coming to an end. But what we need to understand here, and this is going to be the case, it's, it's the case throughout Scripture, and it's much of what we'll see here in this particular book, is that it's okay. Even though for Israel this seems like a very difficult time, and was, it was part of God's plan. God was in the process of moving his people along. Egypt, what we need to understand is that Egypt was a time of preparation for Israel. And if Egypt, it's an interesting thing here, just side note, if Egypt is consistently throughout Scripture and it is a picture of the world, then it would also then make sense that the world is also a time of preparation for God's people. Meaning that this isn't home. This isn't what God has for us. And no differently than the people of Israel, when things start to get difficult here, even though, yes, it affects us, we should have a perspective of, guess what? God has another plan. God has something in store for us. Just as he did for Israel, he said, look, I'm, I, there's a land, there's a special place for you, and I'm going to move you on from this place. So that promise exists for us today. Um, in Genesis 15, same chapter, a little bit later on, beginning in verse 12, it says, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. And then he said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants, listen, so this goes back, you know, well before their time in Egypt, and God is saying to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they, this, this land that they're in, they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But, verse 16, in the fourth generation, they shall return here. Pause there for a moment. So God had already communicated to Abraham, this is what's going to happen. Your people, the descendants that you don't really know about right now, and maybe and clearly your wife's thinking it's kind of funny. How could this possibly happen, right? That I'm going to make of you a great nation. They're going to be a considerable people, but they're going to be in a foreign land for a period of time, and they're going to serve them, and it's going to get hard. But after a certain period of time, I will bring them out. And when I do, they're going to be prosperous. And the people who afflicted them, I'm going to judge them. I'm going to take care of it. And then he goes on to say, for, this is the latter part of verse 16, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Where are the Amorites living? I mean, you know where the Amorites are? In the land of Canaan. So he says the iniquity of the Amorites isn't complete. What he's saying is the very people that I'm going to, as I draw my people out of Egypt and I prepare them to go into the land of Canaan and wipe them all out, he's saying, look, that land's not ready yet. And so what we have to understand big picture here, even over the course of 400 years, is that God is at work. God is at work preparing his people for what he has prepared for them. You understand that? And this is how God works. This is how he continually works. This is how he works in our lives. Sometimes it's a difficult thing for us to see. Sometimes we go, God, where are you? Sometimes we say, God, this is really hard. But we can constantly have the confidence that, God, you are preparing me for what you've prepared for me. Do you understand that? This is the pattern we get in Scripture. And so even though it seems for a moment here like things are going to get dark, God even says, look, it's going to get a little dark. But trust me. 
And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. And on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants, I have given this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. All these sites were there in the land that I have given you. And it's important also to note here, and we won't go down this path either, but he, he says it's from the river Euphrates. So just make a note of the fact that Israel today, as you look at it on a map, is not inhabiting the land. There's much, much more of it that God has, from essentially the beginning of time, the beginning of creation said, this is yours. All right? you go back to our study of Revelation, the millennial reign, Israel inhabiting the land. We believe that those, all of those pieces are connected. So here this time of prosperity is coming to an end. It is a difficult time for Israel, but God has a plan. So what happens then here is, is Pharaoh expresses his concern. Well, he sets out to control Israel. And he does it first by further enslaving and hopefully then weakening them. Slavery is not a, uh, well, it's, it's, it's not, a, a, it's an all-time thing. That's what I'm trying to say. Slavery goes all the way back to the beginning. This has constantly been a people's approach. One people oppresses another people, and one people oppress another people, and it's a way to keep people in bondage and to weaken them and to ensure that they are not uh, effective or not a threat. And so this is how Pharaoh approaches it. Verse 11, therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh, we'll go all the way through uh, verse 14, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, the city Ramses there suggests to some people that that's the Pharaoh that's in power at this particular point. Again, we don't know. Verse 12, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So there's fear. Note this. There is fear that is affecting uh, Pharaoh and uh, the nation of, or the people of Egypt. They're in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. And all their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. And so they're being incredibly hard on the people. They're making life difficult for them. And so what we see here is that even at the very beginning of Israel as a nation, they are under attack. They're under attack. Look, I don't believe that it can be debated that, that there has been any other people group throughout history that has suffered as much as the Jewish people. Throughout history, they have been an oppressed people. They have uh, faced considerable persecution. Generation after generation, they have endured hardship. They've been under attack. And here's the reason why. Because of Satan. And because Satan has continually tried to prevent the work of God, to prevent the birth and the rule of the Messiah. And even though Jesus has come and he's died uh, and he was resurrected and believers in his church are birthed here today, Satan is still at work because he thinks he can prevent his second coming and prevent him from sitting on a forever throne. And of course, we know that he cannot, but Satan will not stop. And so he has continually sought, and we see this story throughout Scripture, has sought to uh, destroy God's people uh, primarily in an effort to prevent the coming of Jesus Christ. And so the Jewish people, they've endured much. But just as God promised in Genesis uh, throughout, especially in Genesis 12, uh, as God first made his covenant with Abraham, those that bless them, the nation of Israel, will be blessed, and those that curse them will be cursed, that God will judge, just as he said he would there in Egypt. And we've seen this throughout history, that those who stand with Israel are blessed. Again, another statement we won't go into necessarily tonight. You can look these things up. You can find these things. It's pretty amazing to even look at the United States of America and to see our periods of prosperity and our periods of, uh, I'll say, relative uh, suffering um, or adversity. And they oftentimes uh, are directly correlated with stances of support for Israel or support that's withdrawn from Israel. 
It's, it's, it's pretty striking to look at. And I think we see this throughout history. But here's the other thing. We know as much as the people of, of Israel have, have gone through, we know that God uses hardships. God uses hardships. That's, that's the amazing thing about who our God is, is that he's able to take these things and he's able to use them. And so we know that they have, uh, the nation of Israel has endured much, but it's also served to strengthen them as a people. I mean, I mean truly, to consider the fact that Israel became a nation again is certainly a result of the hand of God, but it also speaks to the endurance of a people. There's no other story in history of a nation being utterly destroyed and, and dispersed throughout the world and then be able to be established again and return to their homeland. And so God has certainly used uh, what his people have gone through as a way to strengthen. And, uh, and in the same way, God does that in our own lives and, and our faith is strengthened and our faith grows as we endure trials. And so despite the hardship, Israel was strengthened. And so uh, despite what Pharaoh was doing, Israel continues to grow mightier and mightier. So he escalates his approach. Verse 15, then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? So when Pharaoh recognizes that simply uh, coming down on the people harder isn't working, he really escalates things. He calls the Hebrew midwives and uh, he says, Look, when you are going to deliver babies... Uh, he says, when you see them on the birth stools, and uh, ladies, I've never given birth, but when I hear about a birth stool, there's something about that that just causes me to go, ooh, man, that seems awkward and uncomfortable. And so, praise God for advancements in this area. I don't know. But uh, the midwives here, he says, look, when you see that these ladies are giving birth, you need to go and uh, you need to... Uh, if it's a boy, kill that boy. And these, these types of commands are, are, I mean, it's horrific, right? It should cause us to go, my, my goodness. If it's a daughter, she'll live. And you can't imagine these midwives who clearly uh, have a, if, if not simply a profession, a calling to help bring life into the world. And so to expect them then to kill uh, these boys is a horrific thing. But it says the midwives feared who? They feared God. And they did not do what the king of Egypt commanded them. And so, of course, Pharaoh here, here he catches on to this. He's recognizing that, hey, there seem to be Hebrew baby boys being born. What gives? And so what we see here in Scripture is this is really the first act of civil disobedience in Scripture. We know Romans 13, as well as a couple other passages, I think 1 Peter uh, is one of them, uh, that we're called to obey those who are in authority with the understanding that God has ordained them, that he has placed them there in authority, and we're to trust that, that then God is, is using them. But what we also understand is that we are also called to violate the word of those who are in authority, if those who are in authority are calling us to violate the word of God, to disobey God. And so we are called as a people to obey God over man. This is what the midwives did. We see this, an example of this, a wonderful example in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. As the church is birthed and ministry starts to take place and the disciples are told, hey, you better, you better shut it. You better not say any more about any of these things. And of course, they said, well, uh, we're going to be in trouble then. Because we have to tell the world about what God has done and about who Jesus is. And so these midwives are a wonderful example for us here at the uh, early stages of, of Scripture. That they're saying, look, we fear God. We're not going to do this. This is clearly wrong. And in verse 19, the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. I love that too. And he's like, hey, these Hebrew women, man, they can 
pop these babies out. And so we just we can't get there fast enough, man. And, um, and so some people are like, okay, here's the question. Maybe some of you are wondering this too. Did they lie? Are they lying? Uh, this came up in a men's study a couple weeks ago. We were talking about uh, the account of um, uh, Rahab and the spies go in. You know, Rahab's hiding the spies and then she tells them, you know, hey, nothing to see here. And like, can she do that? Uh, and it's an interesting debate to have, right? Um, so, so some people say, no, they didn't lie. Um, they just slowed down a little bit. They just sort of, you know, hey, somebody's having a baby. Let's just stroll on over and whoops, we missed it. And now we can say to Pharaoh, we just can't get there fast enough. Um, that makes some people feel better. Uh, other people are like, oh, they lied. They just straight up lied. Um, I think probably both of those things happened. Um, and listen, just a little bit of a side note on this point in particular is, and I guess it, it probably plays into the rest of this here, is that sometimes, look, sometimes we face things in life. Sometimes we face things in life and we need to make a decision. And, and what we do uh, or what we, how we approach that is we, we pray, we seek the Lord, we seek his, his, his word, and, and we make a call. And we trust that God knows our hearts. I mean, David, David took the showbread from the temple. Why? They needed to eat. He knew that technically he wasn't supposed to do that, but he's like, look, I, I think that probably this is okay. Jesus, he picked grain for food on the Sabbath. Now, Jesus obviously had some good instruction to follow that along, but I think, I think Jesus, of course, knew the heart of God and he knew the heart of Sabbath. Those are slightly different things, of course. I'm not trying to put them on the, all on the same level, but there's decisions that we make. And I think for us, you know, the, for these women, certainly, they, they feared God and they were evaluating something that they said, look, this isn't right. And we can trust that they sought the Lord and they, and they really considered what they were called to and the ramifications of all these things. And they said, we've got to do what's right here. And look, I think that God honors that. Of course, in, in our own history, not that it's our, our, our personal history, but it's, it's recent enough we can't help but probably think of, once again, the nation of Israel, but as it pertains to the Holocaust and those who helped to preserve life during that time. And, and no doubt there was many of those people, man, they lied. They weren't able to just skirt around the issue and ignore it and avoid it. They lied about it. And, and what's, you know, what, what's, what's God do with that? I think God knows our hearts. Am I sitting here tonight advocating, well, everybody start lying? No. And certainly if we lie for selfish gain, then that's a whole other issue. But I think sometimes in life we'd have to set out. And, and here's the deal. Uh, you Praise God that we probably aren't faced with as many circumstances that we can relate to in this way, but we might in the future. Who knows what's, what could start to happen? Who knows what persecution could reach our shores? What will we do? And, and so here we, we have these women who are saying, look, we're, we know what's right. And we're going to preserve life. We're, we're living in increasingly dark times where the potential for fear of God over man is more and more prevalent or likely. And, and so will we trust God or will we be called to trust God at his word and move forward? And verse 20 says, therefore God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. And it's believed that what's being said here is that these, these midwives then had children. A lot of times midwives, uh, that particular profession was reserved for those who were barren, who could not have children. And so God blessed them and they, they had children. And we know that obedience doesn't always bring this kind of blessing, but we trust God. And so Pharaoh doesn't stop. His plans aren't working. He doesn't stop. So in verse 22, Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. And so he's, he's getting stronger and stronger with his threats. And it's interesting because it's really out of fear. It's fear that's motivating Pharaoh's actions. Pharaoh escalates the situation and gives the command to all the people that if they, if they, if they see a male that is born, they're to take him and throw him into the river. Now, some translations render this all males, and, and, and it reads in such a way where it's, is this including the Egyptians and the Hebrews? Is he just at this point saying, if there's a, if there's a male out there, they'd be thrown in the river, they'd be killed? Well, the Septuagint uh, 
uh, states males born to Hebrews, and that would certainly seem to make more sense that Pharaoh wouldn't um, wouldn't have killed the, the Egyptian males. But in either case, you know, this is this is an aggressive stance, right? And it causes me to wonder, maybe you as well, you know, what did people do? We read of these two midwives, what about the other people? And I wonder how many partook of this command. Whether it was fear or whether it was apathy and ruthlessly, ruthlessly tossed little bodies of innocent children into the river. How many turned a blind eye? convince themselves not to care there was nothing they could do and 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 this is this is the challenge right this becomes the challenge as we encounter things like this in scripture because um throughout history we know that inaction because of fear or indifference has often been an issue you know again by the time during the holocaust as people began to see jewish people locked up and imprisoned what did they do of course, as we think about the murder of innocent children in our own country, over 60 million babies aborted. What has the church done? How has the church addressed it? How has the church stood up? Has the church had a voice? And you know, we've seen things here over the last several months, of course, happen in our country with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Do you know what that's really done for abortion laws throughout the country? Essentially nothing. In some cases, yeah, it's impacted the way that organizations can operate. But as some who are sitting here amongst us here today who work in our pregnancy centers can tell you, uh, it's done absolutely nothing to change opinions on abortion or the perceived need for it. In fact, Daybreak Ministries, our local pregnancy care center. What are the statistics at this point? I should, I should know. I just heard them at the board meeting. But I think, I think our, our pregnancy tests, our ultrasounds um, are up over 100% over last year. Right? It's driving more and more women through the doors of Daybreak. I, I say all that to say, <laughs> as we, if we often have recognized that you know, just as you can't legislate revival, you can't legislate a change of heart. Just because Roe v. Wade is in a different state than what it was before, it doesn't mean that there's not a need there that the church needs to respond to, right? That we need to offer a voice to, and even more so that we need to bring, you know, practical action to bear on these particular scenarios and situations. And, 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 and you can go beyond this, and I know I'm out of time, but, there's, you know, there's other justice issues, moral issues that we don't deal with today and many, and many times because it becomes, well, it's too political. There's fear, again, that, you know, what of, what of the blowback or what of the fallout if we uh, offer an opinion on this or a statement on this? And, and throughout history, and this is where I wish we could go tonight, I mean, throughout history, God has raised up people who were not afraid of man and who simply feared God and said, we're going to do what's right. And that's what we start to see in chapter two, just a little bit of a teaser here. It's interesting to me how Moses writes this um, because in chapter two in verses one and two, he says, and a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi so the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid in three months. Very anonymous here in this particular uh, verse. Of course, whom, or rather the child here is Moses, and we'll, we'll start to consider then Moses next week. But um, the man and the woman, it's Amram and Jochebed. We'll hear about them, we'll get their actual names a few chapters later in Exodus chapter 6, just because they're listed there in a genealogy, not because they're really mentioned there, but for us now having the benefit of the, the full scriptures, in particular the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 and verse 23, right, we're told a little bit more about these people. 
And um, we see that um, because they did not fear man, but rather feared God, that they are now listed amongst the, the heroes of the faith. And that God used them in a mighty and powerful way. Um, that they saw that they had a beautiful child, and we'll talk about what that means as well, because it wasn't just simply about the fact that he was maybe a good-looking baby, um, but that there was a calling upon this child's life, that this was a child for whom they prayed, that this was a deliverer that God was raising up, that God birthed into this world, and um, they weren't afraid of the king's command. So here we see a people that are that, that, that it's said of them in that great hall of faith that they were not afraid. There was a Pharaoh that was killing people because he was afraid, but there was a people who said, we're not afraid of him. We're going to fear God, and we're going to do what's right. And out of that step of faith, God raised up a man who he used to deliver a nation. Right? And so we'll deal more with this uh, next week and, and how it has practical bearing on how we live our lives today, but I don't think that's too much of a stretch for us to just grasp here tonight. Right? That... What we see here in this, in this first chapter of this amazing book is that there is a God who from the beginning of time has had a plan and he has a purpose for the lives of those who he has created. And he uses those who are willing and surrender to him for his glory and to accomplish his purposes. And there are times when we face and those people face very difficult circumstances, but what we see is that God is at work in the midst of those circumstances. And if we will be a people who will say, we're not going to fear man. We're not going to fear the response of man. We're going to fear you, God, and we're going to follow you, that he's able to do great things for his glory. Amen? That's what we're called to still today. There's plenty of opportunity for us as a people still today to say, God, we're going to fear you, we're going to obey you, and we're going to allow you to use us to deliver your people. We'll continue that next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time together here this evening. We pray, Lord, that it's pleasing or has been pleasing to you and that it would be fruitful for us, Lord, that as we go from this place here tonight, you, by your spirit, would work these truths deep into our hearts and that in the weeks ahead, Lord, as we consider this amazing book, that, Lord, maybe you would do a work of uh, fostering boldness and confidence within us, Lord, to make bold stances uh, for you in this world in which we live knowing that, Lord, you have your hand upon us, that you are at work, and that you do want to use us for your glory and to accomplish your plans and your purposes. What, a, what an amazing thought that is, Lord. What an amazing truth that is. And so, Lord, may um, you, again, work those truths deep down into our hearts, Lord, and uh, bring the necessary change, Lord, that you desire to see in our lives. Lord, we thank you for our time together. We ask, Lord, for your blessing upon the rest of our evening. Go before each of these here, Lord, as they follow after you. We pray in Jesus' name.